Well, it has already been such an up and down season for Nottingham Forest. This campaign wins over Liverpool and West Ham, but home defeats to Fulham and Bournemouth. So can they, will they stay in the Premier League? So much to talk about with Daniel Storey, a Forest fan and the football correspondent of the independent newspaper. Next. Daniel, fantastic to see you again. Forest in the Premier League, which, you know, as we supped our lagers in pubs around Nottingham over the last 10 years or so, we, we talked about a lot. How do you think mm -hmm. the Reds are handling the step up? I think it's probably been as difficult as Steve Cooper imagined and more difficult than the club imagined. And certainly, I think, therefore, some fans imagine because you know, I went to, to the Market Square for that trophy presentation after the playoff final and to hear Maranakis talk was to quite evidently hear a man who who didn't see 17th place as a, a kind of as an ambition uh, and to my mind 17th is always an ambition when you've got promoted particularly after you've got promoted in the playoff final and with a number of loanees in the team that needed replacing and I think there has been a yeah a reality check for for some people in the club and I also suspect that maybe some people in the club are still struggling with that reality check because it, it, it is humbling watching your team play away at Manchester City and, and let's be honest, away at Leicester as well. Yeah. Where do they go from here, do you think, in terms of what they need to do? Because obviously things from the outside appear to have settled down a bit with Steve Cooper signing a, uh, a new contract. Do you think that does settle things down for a, for a while? I hope so. I think that the results on the pitch will still be everything. I think the support of the fans has been genuinely appreciated by him. I think he probably believes that it's helped him still be in his position now because the outpouring of love towards him, not just because fans know it's been difficult this season, but let's face it, because of what he achieved last season, um, he won't forget that and the fans won't forget it. That That's important. The, the club, in terms of supporters and manager and players and club, they all still feel like, they're on the same page and together, but results on the pitch are everything. And it's been a it's been a pretty chastening few months. It's been a few months that I think Forest would probably like to have their time again and think about things differently. There was a need to buy new players. We all know that. I don't think there was a need to buy 22 new players, and I don't think there was a need for the the kind of late splurge of signings in at, at both after the season had started and in the last couple of days of the transfer window. I think that probably made things worse rather than better, uh, mainly because I think it meant Forrest could never fly under the radar, which I think Fulham and Bournemouth have managed to do a little bit. Uh, Forrest seemed in the kind of eyes of the national media and kind of supporters in England to go from this really feel-good story of we're really glad Forrest are back to, uh, oh, they're, they're arrogant, they're trying to spend loads <laughs> of money. Who do they think they are trying to stay in the division? Yeah, yes. and, that, and that was it. And, and it suddenly became right we really want to beat Nottingham Forest now. It would be really funny if Nottingham, if this all collapsed and Forest went down. So Forest lost that kind of good guys tag and also lost that ability to fly under the radar and surprise teams, I think, because let's face it, everything they did on the pitch was surprising themselves because they didn't really know each other at the start of the season. But they had to sign a fair chunk of players, didn't they? I mean, I, it, it seems to me a black and white argument. You either think Forest have signed too many or you think they needed to, but isn't the truth kind of in the middle that, yes, they needed to sign a lot of players, but also it's not ideal to have signed that many players, that many new players? No, it isn't. It really isn't. And it's harder than, than anyone thinks, because I think to an extent, all of us have been kind of warped slightly by, um, you know, fantasy football and FIFA culture and football manager culture, where you just kind of build a squad together and hope it fires. And, the reality is 10 times more difficult than that. And it's probably 100 times more difficult when you're doing it after a promotion to a, a league you haven't been in for more than two decades. They did. They, they clearly did need to sign a huge number of players. The, the loanies that left was made things very difficult. I would have liked them to try and maybe keep some of those loan players. But then with, with two of them, for example, Garner and Spence, it just became difficult because Spence had a bigger offer that he understandably wanted to take. Manchester United clearly wanted to wait on Ghana until the end of the window and Forrest felt that they couldn't afford to wait. And so players come in and I think it's undoubted that there are numerous voices in the Forest boardroom when it comes to transfers and 
everyone had their own ideals. And at a point in the summer, it felt like everyone was getting their way because they were signing everyone. Um, and and the other the other thing which I think has been slightly overlooked by supporters, and I feel for those the, the players in question, is that when you sign so many new players, it isn't just about those new players. It's about the very few that stay in the team who were already there. Because when you've signed, if you've got a team that's got, for example, eight new players in and, and three of the ones that are left are, are Brennan Johnson, Ryan Yates and, and Joe Worrell, let's say, it, it, it hugely increases the pressure on those three players because fans inevitably will think, well, if we've replaced eight players, we don't think, we think these three are struggling as well. So why don't we just buy new ones for these? Why don't we just play a whole new team? And it's not as simple as that because you have no. to have something that links the manager and the players and, you, and, the, and the players and the club and, and last season to this season. And, and th- they are three of the players who continue or have done this season to get almost get the most criticism, which I just feel for them so much because they, they put in a superhuman effort last season to get promoted way ahead of schedule. And now they are the target for some criticism because they're struggling like everyone else's. But... The other thing is, Forrest last season, to my way of looking at it, and obviously results early on prove this, had a bottom half championship squad, certainly at the point that Steve Cooper came in, because that's, you know, they were bottom. So they, they at least had a bottom half championship squad. You might argue they were underachieving under Chris Hute, and I think most people would agree with that, but they still had a bottom half championship squad. So to make that leap, to overachieve and get promotion, it, mm. it was going to take something dramatic to get it anything like ready for Premier League football. Yeah, it was. And and the stars of that team or some of the stars of that team were were Brees Samba, the goalkeeper, who kind of led by example and his distribution was great and, and he's left. It was Jed Spence, that combination of Spence and Johnson on the right and, and Spence has left. It was Lewis Graben having a, a remarkable season given his age and the amount, the workload he'd had over the previous few seasons and and obviously he's left. It was James yeah. Garner being able to drive from midfield with the ball, but also be kind of feisty without it, which I think Forrest are lacking and, and he's left and, and so on and so forth. It, it is a completely new team now. It's, it's not even a team that, that got promoted last season. It's a, it's a year dot team. And having a year dot team in the Premier League, it, it was always going to take a long time. I do believe that Cooper is a good enough coach that, we will see some improvement if he's given that time. But the question is obviously how far behind the eight ball you are when that comes, because there are a lot of difficult fixtures left in the season because we've already played Fulham at home and Bournemouth at home and Villa at home and Leicester away. And it would almost have been better for Forrest to play, you know, all of the big six in the first seven games and think, well, at least we've, we've got those out of the way and we'll have a good run to come. But we have sort of wasted that, that gentler run of fixtures. And also two of the, new signings who perhaps impressed the most in the early stages of the season, Mangala and Nia Kate have got injured have been, and have been out basically for this poor run, effectively. Do you, do you put much store by that? Yeah, I do. I mean, we didn't see that much of, of the two of them, but what we did see made, made us think that they are automatic starters in that team. And uh, the one thing that every promoted club crosses their fingers on is that your, your most reliable, your most dependable players, wherever they are on the pitch, have to stay fit. You know, Fulham have got Alexander Mitrovic injured at the moment. And if he's injured for any long period of time, they will drop down the table. That's the reality. You have to have those key players there. Um, They're obviously new players and they're both quite young as well. So their progress this season will not be a linear upward curve. There are always going to be pits and falls in this Forest team because they, they wanted to buy young initially with some resale value. And then they ended the window by kind of not throwing money, but just ending up looking at what almost what was available rather than what made sense. Uh, and the combination of those two things, particularly when two of the best younger ones are injured, is has been pretty damning. Mangala looked exactly what Forrest need, which is a yeah. is someone to to win the ball at times, but more than that, drive forward with it and recycle play and stop Johnson and Gibbs White having to drop so deep just to pick up the ball. Because even against Villa on Monday, and I thought Forrest were the better team in the second half, they're a team that it looks like four or five things need to happen really well just to create a clear-cut chance. Uh, and that's really difficult when you're playing against elite defences. Yeah. Um, you touched on Steve Cooper and the fans' kind of reaction to the suggestion that he was going to leave the club. Do you think as well the fact that other clubs in and around Forest, I'm thinking of Southampton, for example, 
were linked with Steve Cooper should he become available and should they sack their own managers. Do you think that helped at all as well in terms of, because if I was the owner of a club and my manager was being linked with other clubs around and I was thinking of sacking him, then that would make me think twice. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's the, the, the kind of looming unspoken truth, which is that if a manager's, if a club does now come in for Steve Cooper, Forrest will be due a, a large amount of compensation because he's now got two and a half years left on a contract. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, look, there was clearly a moment where something shifted in, in Forrest, whether it was, um, you know, whether it was Cooper being very frank about what he thought were the deficiencies within the club off the field, whether it was the the owners and the decision makers being swayed by the outpouring of love from supporters, whether it was some admissions of, of failure on the part of certain individuals who, you know, we know that Forrest have since sacked George Sirianos and the head of recruitment and sacked Andy Scott, the head scout. Uh, you know, that's being reported. So there's clearly some fairly seismic tete-a-tete taking place. And the end result of that is that Cooper signs a new contract. Does that mean I think he is completely happy with everything happening at the club? Absolutely not. I don't see how he could be given, given what the summer we've had. Does it mean that Cooper is completely safe in his job now? I, I, I can never believe that because you know as well as I do that this is Forrest and we, we're, we're currently closing in on our first year, calendar year since 2010, having not sacked a manager. And Is that right? Right. That yeah, that's right. right. So that was, that was, Billy, that was Davies Billy Davis. Making, yeah. yeah. Second time uh, round. Yes, second yes, time round. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's what we're we're waiting to counting down the days on the advent calendar to see if we can make it through 2022 with the same manager. And I couldn't hand on heart say I'm wholly confident that we will, because I just think it's so hard to pick up results, but um, I, I, yeah, I'm incredibly glad my, my, my feelings in order when, when that news came through was a delighted, be surprised and see a little bit confused because it, it felt at odds with everything that was building up behind the scenes. But the first two, you know, I'm happy to part the confusion if for the delight and the surprise. Uh, the other thing is, it occurs to me that if they go down, and you know, obviously we hope they don't, but if the worst were to happen and Forrest get relegated, isn't Steve Cooper exactly the sort of manager that you'd want to get them out of the championship again? He is. I, I do think that's slightly simplistic in that there will have been, if Forrest do go down with Cooper, there will have been a, an awful lot of water, <laughs> you know, flown under under. Trent Bridge and uh, I do think that that might stick a little bit we, we saw with Daniel Farker at, at Norwich that he was then able to get them up after the first time they went down but that was a very different situation in that they almost sacrificed their Premier League place for the, the kind of greater bigger picture and they didn't really sign any players I think it's quite unusual for a manager um, to survive after such a big spend and such a big kind of clamour to stay in the Premier League he is a he is a as good a coach as Forrest could ever have, I think, given where they've been at over the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, but I think something would have shifted if we then go down with him. And and let's face it, it, it next summer, knowing all we do about Forrest behind the scenes, there will be players in that squad who quite fancy a move away from Forrest and we sign them because they would have resale value. We would presumably buy another host of players and it just becomes difficult again. So how did he do it last season? How did Steve Cooper do what he did, given the number of people and, you know, fans will have their own opinions on, on various managers, but there are some managers who've come in with very good CVs and nothing has happened for them at, at Forest and within a year they're out the door. So what, what was it that he did? What was the combination of circumstances that led to it almost immediately clicking? Yeah, I think there are, there are, I mean, there's obviously not one single thing. I think there's a, no. there's a few. I think, per, firstly, I think he found a squad that had young players at its core uh, and with the potential to lead the team uh, in all areas. So, yes, Jed Spence at right back and, and Johnson and James Garner. Uh, and I think, and Joe Worrell and Ryan Yates. And I think having that combination of players who he, who the club already had, who were young, and who they'd signed who were young. Uh, I think Cooper is, a, is probably the best manager in England at the moment um, in terms of managing youth. You know, he's shown that throughout his career in, 
in, in his work in Liverpool's academy, in his work, his, his phenomenal work with England under 17s. Uh, and I think that had a kind of a double effect. I think it, it made him think this is a really good job for me because there's young players and I can improve them quickly. And I think it made the, those young players think we've got a manager here who won the World Cup with the England under 17 team. So imagine what he could do with us. And I think that that became pretty powerful pretty quickly. I think he also understood the need to bring the supporters completely on side, not just with the team and the man- and, and the players, but with the manager as well, and have them believing that, you know, the whole kind of three cheers to the crowd every game, it, it can feel a bit manufactured. But if, if, if everything you say is about, I'm really proud to be here, I can't believe I'm here, it, you know, this is everything I've wanted. I can't wait to see what I can do at Forest. That that works with supporters. We know it does. It's so easy. And Forest have been clamoring after that for so long. Um, and I think he was just a, he was a different, you know, you talk about the reputations of managers we've appointed. That's true, but I think he he had a different profile to all of those. You know, he he wasn't or firstly, he wasn't taking a step down in terms of clubs. He hasn't come from a Premier League job down or he hadn't, he didn't feel like he was slightly scaling backwards. He was a domestic coach who had had experience working with domestic players and working on pretty difficult circumstances at Swansea. And he really, he seemed to really, really want to be there. Um, and I think the other thing is, you know, I, I spoke to, um, I interviewed Paul Heckingbottom the other day at Sheffield United. And he was saying there's two things that, that people don't realize the first is just how important momentum is that when you build up some momentum it players will do things on the pitch without you even coaching them that you did you, you never expect them to be able to do just because they're feeling happy and they feel like everything's working and the second thing is is luck and he's you know Paul Heckenbottom would say this but he's got on his desk a, a, a silver stud in a little case and that stud is to reflect Brees Samba getting that tiny touch on the ball in the first minute of that second playoff leg playoff final to keep Forrest in the lead when we'd started appallingly and it kind of slipped from that point. And he said, those moments just make a difference. And he, he said, you know, I'm not being bitter here, but Forrest had a number of those moments over the last 10 games and playoffs that went their way and you look at the playoff final and it's true you know yeah. you get a touch off yeah. a defender it goes in the corner you get the VAR decisions that somehow could both go Forest's way and at that point to players that begins to feel like destiny you know that, the moment of last season to me was like Jack Colback crossing himself when he realised he wasn't going to get punished for the penalty in the final and that makes players feel like you know this is our turn this is finally yeah. going to happen and I think Cooper was brilliant at engineering that and also on a much more mon- mundane level, the moment it occurred to me from a distance that something may be brewing was a game at Ashton Gate against Bristol City. I don't know if you remember it, but Forest were 1-0 down going into stoppage time, yet won the game. Yeah. And that's the sort of thing that I've watched over the last 20 years covering Forest happen to Forest yeah. in various yeah. leagues. And for the first time that I can remember, it happened and benefited Forest because yeah. they had that... And that was pretty early on in the Steve Cooper regime. That yeah. that kind of thing engenders so much belief. Yeah, it does. I mean, you, you go back to the obvious of, of Stoke at home on that final day when it, it, it begins to feel like everything is fated against Forest. And the reality is that's not the case. The reality is there are a number of those moments in every match. And if you are confident, if you're well coached, if you've got, you know, if you've got belief, if you're if you've got technical ability and you want it enough then you aim to manage those moments in your favour and that's what Forrest did in games like Bristol City and let's face it in the the playoff semi-finals against Sheffield United because and against Huddersfield they got lucky but they would suggest that we put ourselves in a position where we were owed some luck because we were finally doing everything right and it's no coincidence that when you have a manager who feels like he's doing everything right those moments do go for you more often than not. You know, go to arguably the best manager the country's ever known outside Nottingham Forest in, in Ferguson. And the whole thing was always like, oh, they get so lucky in injury time and they, they win so many points. And it's like, well, yeah, that's that's because they're relentless and they believe that they everything is weighted against their opponents in that last five minutes. And I genuinely believe Cooper gave Forest that same feeling. The worry for me in the Premier League is it's so much harder to believe in that because... Yeah. Everything is weighted against you. 
More to come in just a moment. I want to thank my members of Chippers Club, particularly gold members. Their names are on the screen now. If you want to help support the channel, I'd love you to do so. You can sign up for Chippers Club. The link is in the description below. Or there are other ways of supporting the channel as well. Uh, you can click on the dollar sign below to make a one-off donation or sign up to my Patreon page as well. Uh, that has these chats as podcasts. You pay a small fee per month and you can hear these as podcasts. That will help. Or, uh, if you don't want to contribute financially, you can't afford to, that's absolutely fine, obviously. Um, but just click the like button below for free, or subscribe for free below, and that will help spread these videos much further. Let's get back to Daniel's story. So how difficult, and have you, I mean, you've, you've obviously covered Premier League football for the independents, so you've, you've seen it with your own eyes, but do you feel the gap is, is wider than most Forest fans believed it would be between the Championship and, and the Premier League. Given, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it has been an extraordinary amount of time since Forrest were there, obviously. But even watching it on the television, perhaps you don't get the appreciation you do of actually being in the ground. Yeah, it's, it's, it's bigger than anyone could know, and it's growing all the time. Uh, it, for a number of reasons, but the, the main thing is just the sheer depth in, in, in squads that, that other clubs have. And any of those three promoted clubs, if, if things have gone against them or they've made bad decisions, could finish bottom on 10 points. That's just how it is now. There isn't that floor for other clubs. And what that means is you have to over overperform just to cope. And, and yes, you hope that you overperform in enough games or, and you overperform in games where your opponents underperform so you can pick up enough points and try and rebuild that momentum. But that's what makes a quick start so important. And, and unfortunately, because of the circumstances, Forest haven't been able to have that. But the gap is absolutely outrageous it really is you know you, you look at for example Manchester City's results in cup competitions and and in Premier League games and if they wanted to they could score 10 most weeks I honestly believe that against bottom half sides it comes down to them managing no minutes it comes down to them doing enough and still winning by four or five rather than eight or nine but it's it's frightening it really is and 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 I always expected that because, as you say, I've covered the Premier League and I've covered Forest, and I know how it's just little things like the first touch that creates a bit of space. Forest, Forest first touch, it's just not quite there because they're not quite good enough and it's not quite clicking. Yeah. And yeah, it's 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 obscene the gap. It really is. And and as I say, the one benefit of this season, and as long as Forest haven't spent all their broadcasting revenue, is that it's a good time to get up because their gap is growing and growing. And do you think the amount of scrutiny and focus there is on, on Premier League clubs has caught people by surprise as well? The kind of the constant media churn and chatter about clubs generally. And everybody seems to have an opinion on, on Nottingham Forest all of a sudden. They've, they've signed too many players or they've signed the wrong players. And, it, it, you know, you I, over here in Sydney, I... You get people who think, oh, they signed too many players. And last year, six months ago, they, they had to ask <laughs> what division they were in. So it kind of, the focus is, yeah. is remarkable in the Premier League. Yeah, it is. Uh, and it, it can be all consuming. I, I do think that players and managers certainly uh, have to be able to switch off from that and by and large are able to switch off from that. Um, but for supporters, it's very interesting because I think Forest fans have fought, fell into a trap this summer of, you know, I think nine months ago or six months ago, if you'd have surveyed a thousand football fans aged between 20 and 50 in the, in this country, a vast majority of them would have picked Forest in their kind of ideal Premier League, the, the Premier League that they feel would be the most fun to watch and feels the most kind of right to them because of the history and because of um, the 20 years without Premier League football and the notion that we're a, in inverted commas, big club and it's a great away day and, and very quickly that turns when you actually get in the Premier League. Uh, I think other clubs have realised that as well. I think Leeds probably managed to kind of ride the crest of a wave for a while because of the, the football and Bielsa and it being really interesting. But soon it changes and everyone thinks, well, no, hang on a minute. I want my team to finish above Leeds. So I don't like them anymore and I don't like the way they're doing things. And that happened to Forest very quickly because of the number of players they bought. Suddenly it wasn't old. You know, it's great to see old Forest back in the Premier League. It's, hang on a minute, Forest think they can buy the buy their way to success and how dare they sign 22 many, two players and it's going to be really funny when they collapse. And 
everything turns on its head and you have to get used to that very quickly and to be frank if if you're at forest and you let that bother you then you're in the wrong job because yeah that was always going to happen and was it always this way for other clubs who'd come up so you know a little while ago now but burnley for example who who came up swansea uh, bournemouth when they first came up. i remember bournemouth being a bit of a story because they are you know 15 years before they'd been in the bottom of the, the fourth division or whatever but was the was the focus, the intensity so big on them or is it because Forrest have signed those 22 players? I think I think there was always going to be a Forrest story because of how big they are or have been historically and how big the promotion was and the circumstances it came in and, you know, the way it felt slightly magical from Cooper's appointment onwards. I think there was always going to... And, and let's be frank, uh, and including both of us here, but well, including myself and you working on it, there is a lot of Forest fans in the media. There are a lot of Forest fans high up in the media. And because of this, the history from 75 to 90, um, those people, you know, there's a reason for that. Forest were a very popular club in those years and therefore that had a knock-on effect that those people fell in love with football and therefore they love, you know, fell in love with writing about the game or watching the game. So that's made a difference. But I think Forest were always going to be a story. It was a good story, yeah. It was yeah, a good yeah. story, yeah. And and therefore, and Bournemouth, because Bournemouth have been in the Premier League recently, because Fulham are a bit of a yo-yo club, they weren't going to be a big story unless, you know, even, even you know, Bournemouth lost 9-0, sacked a manager, and then and are now eighth in the Premier League. And that's still not a big story, really, yeah. in terms of national You don't focus. see, I, I always look at the kind of, because we're on YouTube, you've got things pop up on your your list of what you, you want to watch. And Simon Jordan's got an opinion on yeah. uh, on Forrest. And you think, well, yeah. who's, who's Simon Jordan to have an opinion on? Former Crystal Palace chairman. But it's part of the kind of yeah. the, the, the narrative that, that goes on. And, and that, I think, has been perhaps difficult to, to get used to. I'm yeah, not just picking think... on Simon Jordan. I mean, that's an example of, of many others as well. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's probably one of the mistakes that Forrest made this summer is that they seem to kind of revel in that uh, that f- newfound fame and that celebrity that had come with the club and the fact that there was so much focus around the club. I think that probably not forced their hand, but it kind of emotionally persuaded certain people at the club to think, yes, this is, you know, this is why we'll buy lots of transfers because suddenly Fabrizio Romano is tweeting about us. Suddenly David yeah. Ornstein is writing articles about, you know, little old forests. And, and I think we probably, and, and I think supporters fell into that trap as well. But I would always blame supporters the least because if you can't get excited when your club's got promoted to the Premier League, when can you? Uh, but yes, I think the club probably fell into that trap a little bit. The best thing to have done would have been to ignore all that noise, stick to a kind of, you know, we were told last season that plans were being made, transfer plans were being made in case Forrest got promoted to the Premier League. I don't know if we stuck to those plans, but I'd be very surprised if Renan Lodi was and Serge Aurier were on, on those lists, put it that way. So I think that probably shaped their plans a little bit too much and I think they probably enjoyed that a little bit too much but that story was always going to happen whatever and when you start the season slowly and things do look to look a little bit messy um, they were always likely to get both barrels because everyone was set up to tell the forest story whatever it was. I guess there was the signings were for me personally seemed fine up to a certain point and then it seemed it seemed to me a bit ludicrous it felt like too many. Uh, I don't yeah. know what you thought about that, but it, it the early ones were felt to me optimistic um, players you could get behind. You could understand why they've been signed. Even Jesse Lingard, I could I was on board with that. I could see all that, but it just seemed the, the final three or four just seemed a bit OTT to me. Yeah, it felt it, it felt like, and I, I'm not speaking of position of of any you know inside insight here, but um, it felt like there was a a fairly substantial panicking after the Newcastle game on the opening day when I think the owners and everyone was kind of hoping for this sort of celebration of we are back and, oh, Newcastle haven't signed many players this summer. Maybe we could go up there and turn them over. And they got, you know, completely outpassed and and, and outclassed by Newcastle. Uh, it was a 2-0 drubbing. It really was. And I think that set in some panic uh, unnecessarily, I think. And yes, I, I, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. I think those those later signings they've made. And I'd include, you know, I'm, I'm very happy to be wrong on any of these, but I'd include Emmanuel Dennis, I'd include Willie Bolly, I'd include Serge Aurier, Renan Lodi. Uh, 
all those players, even even Remo Froilo, I know is is back in the team, but they just they feel like they were sort of right who is available signings rather than who have we been planning to buy and and to an extent and unless the transfer is just dragged on no sign you make in the final days of the transfer window is planned and some of those you know sometimes it comes off and you, you land someone and you think this is this is brilliant you know this is what we've done but you know for goodness sake Manchester United signed Cristiano Ronaldo in the final days of a window last year as a panic and 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 even that has gone badly so if it can happen there it can you know with players of that caliber it can it can happen at Forest and yeah I think I think the thing that they didn't anticipate is just how much more difficult that might make it for Steve Cooper on the training ground in terms of having so many bodies because you know I can't imagine that Emmanuel Dennis was signed without being told that he would be a key member of the first team I can't imagine the same is true of Awani or Lingard or Gibbs White and they must have told Johnson to sign a new contract that they wanted to build around him and suddenly you've got five or six players that, that expect to be in the first team and they physically can't all be in the first team because we're playing 11 a side sport and it doesn't work like that. The question then is, are there three, as it stands, are there three worst sides in the Premier League at the moment that will mean that Forest do not get relegated? Uh, as it stands at the moment, there aren't three worst sides. I'm, I'm not sure there might be one um, in terms of current performance, but I don't think there are three. The question is whether this is a blip as Forrest kind of managed to cope and they improve as other sides continue to fall. And that's where I think there is some potential hope. I think that Wolves are, are struggling. I think that Bournemouth will eventually, well, let's face it, if Forrest stay up, I think Bournemouth are going to have to go down. <laughs> you know, I don't mean any offence to them, but that's how it's going to have to be. Uh, the same might not be true of Fulham, although... If Fulham, again, if Fulham stay up, you're suddenly scratching around for teams. Uh, and then I think there are a group of clubs who potentially could either stay where they are in trouble or get sucked down into trouble. And they are, are Leicester and Southampton and Brentford and Leeds. Um, and yeah, you're hoping that, that that happens and you're hoping that they get sucked into it. But you then play one of these teams, you play a Leicester away and you think, OK, so these, these are below us. They haven't won yet this season. This is a game that we need to hold our own in. And suddenly James Madison scores some twipes from outside the box and Harvey Barnes scores a brilliant goal and Patson Dacca scores an outrageous flick. And, and I'm sat watching it thinking, can any of the, can any Forest players do that? Would I, would I back any Forest player to score all those goals um, in, in the kind of, in the situation they're in where they're still learning each other's games? Probably not. It's, it's so unforgiving um, that, yeah, I think you're relying on clubs seriously underperforming. And look, there are always a couple of clubs every year who seriously underperform. But I remember as a follower of the Premier League before Forrest got promoted last season, I remember being quite pleased that Burnley and Watford had gone down from a, a Premier League neutral point of view because they felt like two clubs who had, had kind of shown everything they got. We knew what to expect from them. And I like to see surprises in the Premier League when I follow it. And my God, I wish that neither of them had gone down now because <laughs> they would have been exactly the sort of clubs that you're hoping to get dragged yeah. down into it. Um, yeah. Because, you're, the, you know, when I talk about Wolves getting dragged into it or Leicester or Southampton, they are stronger clubs than Burnley and Watford were. So we're, we're asking for even more than happened last season, really. Because those clubs have been established in the, in the Premier League for, uh, Burnley was what, six or seven seasons? Yeah. Uh, I know Watford have been up and down a little bit, but they've been up and down so many times that they have the basis of a, being a Premier League club. Yeah. And they, they, and that gives you a Premier League, both a Premier League infrastructure uh, in that they can spend in January if they can. Now that, that doesn't really apply to Leicester. And they also have um, a Premier League mindset, which is that when you get to it, they have players who are better than the, the players who have come up. That, that's inevitable. Um they don't. They that none of those clubs, maybe barring Leeds aside, don't aren't known for kind of collapsing or panicking. They you know, they're known for kind of sticking with the process and, and seeing that it gets done. And and they might come a cropper this season. You know, Wolves might. This might be the season that the kind of Fosun and George Mendes model comes crashing down. And Forest need to hope that is the case. But you are sort of <laughs> the best way to describe it is you. Are, we are sort of hoping to toss a coin three times and get three heads. And that's what Forest need now. It's not just a, a, you know, the way they started means it's not just a toss of the coin if Forest stay up. They need to kind of 
they need to rely on a bit of something else. The weird thing is they're what a couple of points off being fifteenth, yeah. sixteenth, or something. So yeah. they, despite everything that's happened, because they had a an average start, let's say in the first four or five games, they're not cut adrift. They do have no. the opportunity. Yeah, they do, and they play teams around them. And look, I always said to friends that were getting very carried away in the summer, I always kind of said, look, if even if Forest are nineteenth come the World Cup and they're not cut adrift, then that should be seen as a success because we have to hope for, partly because of the the way the squad has been formed this summer and partly because Cooper did exactly the same last season, we have to hope that the second half of the season is better than the first. So as long as Forest are in touch by the World Cup, they have a chance. The, the, the two caveats to that is, A, they might not be in touch and B, there's no guarantee that Cooper will still be there if <laughs> if the ambition of the club was to finish you know, around mid-table rather than 17th. Because if they don't see 17th as a success story, and I'm sure they do now, I'm sure they get it now, but if they didn't, then it kind of shifts all expectation of everything and just makes everything feel a little bit harder. So, look, I hope I'm spectacularly wrong. And I was and I was spectacularly wrong last season. I never saw Forrest going up last season until about a minute and a half towards the end of the playoff final. So I'm more than happy to be wrong on that. But, um, yeah, there, there's a reason why... Th- this is a very long-winded way of answering your question, but there's a reason why, to me, Wembley was a, a kind of unique experience in itself, in that me and, and, and many of the Forest fans around me didn't see it as the beginning of something. Of Normally, when a club wins a playoff final, I think, this is the beginning, we're going to you know, we're going to the Premier League, this is the start of everything. For Forest, it kind of felt like the end of something, in that this was a kind of redemption story of all those 20 years of, of, of let's face it, <laughs> unmitigated ball eight pretty generally and that that's felt like putting it. yeah yeah and that's a that's a pc way of putting it as well um, <laughs> yeah and, and and it was the end of that it was a marker of you know every time we've got there we've done a stoke at home or we've done a sheffield united in the playoff final or we've done a blackpool or a yeovil every time we've had a chance we've blown it and this is about finally writing that wrong because not only we're we going to get to wembley we're actually going to win it at wembley and, and, and it was, I, you know, I, I, it took me a couple of days afterwards, even as someone who works on the Premier League, to kind of process that Forest were going to be in the Premier League. And I, I think, without getting too deep into it, I think psychologically that was probably me preparing for the fact that it was going to be, I knew how hard it was going to be. And that we should probably judge that Wembley thing as something glorious in itself, not as, oh, this is the new start of Forest finishing top half in the Premier League, because it, it, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. See, my my reaction was, and my glass is always half empty, as you know, but my feeling was they've got promoted. So if Forest get relegated, then they will be Norwich or Watford or somebody like that, who will have a huge advantage to get back up again, if needs be. It's almost a reset of the club to make you financially viable for for another few years. Yeah, and and the risk is that my potential resentment and regret about this season would be if Forest have spent all the broadcasting revenue on new players to try and stay up and don't manage it, that we are then kind of reliant on the parachute payments to get us back up, and we we've missed a chance to make ourselves semi sustainable uh, financially. Uh, that would be a shame. Although I can I can completely see how it happens when you have a, an extremely wealthy owner because. He is thinking about his own ambition and, and let's face it, it's his money and it's it's his club. Um, yeah, I, I mean, when Forrest went, I think it was beginning of June, I, did, I, I put on Twitter a, a kind of my ideal transfer list and it had these very slightly budget signings, if I'm honest. It had, you know, Keenan Davis and it, yeah, it had Jed Spence and it had Sander Berger, I think, from West Brom and Elias Chair at QPR and um, Loic Capenda, who was a striker in the Eredivisie. And it... Um, yeah, the, the main response was kind of, this seems really low key and and, and it was low key and, and I wish they'd have done it because I, I had no problem with Forrest going straight back down because I'd seen Wembley as the begin, the end of some things kind of psychologically and emotionally. And I didn't have a huge, yes. Yeah, I didn't have a huge problem with Forrest doing a Norwich in effect and ex- buying players and trying to build something but trying to rely on the mood that Steve Cooper had built rather than... Um, building a new team and then if we did go down he was the best manager for it in hindsight I don't think 
necessarily the owners we have are the, are the sort of owners from all we've seen at Olympiacos and at Forest are realistically the sort of owners to to let that kind of thing play out and not an organic them, growth no and they're not and, and they are to their credit they are incredibly ambitious and that ambition does not really involve allowing a manager to take you back down again having waited you know and the way they look at it is look you wait more than two decades to get here why on earth would you be happy to go down again and i completely yeah. understand that and there will be forest fans who also completely agree with them and not with me but i didn't have a huge problem with it if it was the part of something big because the one thing that cooper did feel like he'd instilled was a kind of organic growth and where it, suddenly forest felt quite smooth and calm again and that is no mean feat at forest because it has never been like that and you know that for longer than I do. My thanks to Daniel Storey for his time. We'll see what happens with Forrest over the coming months. One thing is for certain, it is never dull. Have you seen my video with Andy Reid? He talks about his Forrest career. I'll put the link here, but YouTube doesn't want you to watch that one. It fancies that you watch this one here.